We're about to get started. This is Trinity Baptist Church and our Sunday morning worship. We'd like to welcome you that are online. Let's stand and sing if you uh, can. Number 330, uh, Only Trust Him. And uh, Kevin is going to help us with number 330, Only Trust Him. pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to be in the house of the Lord with the believers. Yes. You've given us this example in the New Testament, Lord, that on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, the Resurrection Day, you meet together. And Lord, we're a small group, maybe a larger group with those who are listening online. But Lord, we're thankful that we can do that in a free country. Lord, I pray that we would be humble, that we would be uh, thinkers as we listen to the word of God, as we take it in. And Lord, check the scripture for the truth and what you have laid down and, and given to us through your word. May we listen and may we react and let it touch our hearts and give us hope for the future. Uh, help us, Lord, we pray. We pray for the gospel that it makes a difference in our lives today. That Jesus came and he died and he shed his blood and the reason he did it was to pay the penalty for our sin. We're thankful that those of us who know Jesus are sinners wa washed whiter than snow. Thank you, Lord, for that. Help us as we continue to lift up your name and worship you in your precious name. Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Next one is 350. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 350. 350. Thank you. 
it's sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin itself to cease just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus, Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more I'm so glad I learned to trust him precious Jesus Savior friend and I know saw the battery low sign there, so hopefully the battery won't go dead <laughs> in the middle of the song. <laughs> we'll see what happens. We're going to do His Mercy is More. So. Lord of love, to remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, and all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Hold on, let me get through. Here we go. What patience would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the death we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Since they are many, His mercy is more. 
Thank you, Connor and Kevin will help us one more time. And then we have something, something, I guess it's a surprise because we've never really done this. So we have a special that we worked on and it's like maybe everyone's favorite song. So you'll find out about that in just a minute. Well, a lot of us are. One of my favorite songs anyway, it's about heaven. And uh, anyway, so you'll f have to wait for that. We'll do that right before the message. And it really works well. It's a great lead into the message. So I'm excited about that. Appreciate Kevin and Connor being uh, servants to the Lord by giving their time and their efforts and helping with uh, help, helping me, taking some of the burden off. I really appreciate them. And uh, it's, a, it's a great blessing to have them working here at Trinity Baptist Church. So glad you all could be here at home and then here. Uh, so glad to see everybody out on this warm Sunday. Nice to have a little warmth. Yesterday I got up like in the 80s and we were up here working. If you peek inside um, the room there, Santa went away. Uh, he was working on the palm trees though today as he came in. You might have seen Santa. But uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's Brandy's uh, uh, stepdad. He looks like Santa. You know, his name is Quincy. He really does. And uh, anyway, but uh, we had a, a plastic Santa. And if you ever peeked in there, you probably saw him. But that stuff's all moved out. So now we're ready for spring, and uh, we had such a good time sharing the Christmas spirit and the joy of Christ this last winter time. It was really great, uh, but we're moving on, and we can look forward now to Resurrection Sunday, which is coming up in April. I'm excited about that, how that's going to come about as we have our sunrise service that we have here at the cross, and anyway, excited about that. So anyway, it's spring, and that's a very exciting time for Good time. Uh, some people. summer and we're going to start our fundraising for that. We have some stuff for a garage sale that just got donated and that's good and uh, we will have some more projects. If you'd like your car waxed, cleaned and waxed like detailed, uh, that's usually our main way of raising money. So we just kind of like every car in the church gets waxed. So if you look at our cars that come in that, that are here every year, you'll notice there's no oxidation because they get waxed every summer by our group. So, um, which is cool, you know, I, my cars have never had that problem because I've been doing this for something like 15 years or something with different groups that have been our youth group. We just detail your car and if you do it once a year, you're pretty good, you do it twice a year, you're really good, but we do it once a year for you. So uh, it's a one way to help kids go to camp. So, all right, let's take our offering. I'm just, I'll just ask a blessing on that and then I'll pass the plate. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to give. May you help us in that, help us to give in a way that's um, humble and thankful, we pray in Jesus' name.
one more song, and that is, here's your C, Across the Land. So let me get that set up here. So, let me make, hope this works. <laughs> so I have a, I signed up for one of those hot spots, right? And, uh, uh oh. Hmm. And, um, so I've got the hop, hot spot working right now. I thought it was all ready to go. Second. So we're going to do a song that a lot of you know, but I'll just let it, let it sing for itself. I can only imagine what it'll feel like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. Only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all you be still? 
stand in your presence, to my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, I can only imagine, I can only imagine, I can only imagine. All right, so, so you guys don't have to preach after singing, doing that song. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. One of my favorite songs, and we uh, are church youth group. Yeah, thank you, bud. Get that taken care of. Got it. Thanks, Caleb. You could have done that whispering in my ear later on. <laughs> All right. So we got the opportunity to hear Bart and his group sing it. And uh, I don't know if you, you've probably seen the movie. Uh, really, really well done movie um, about this guy and his dad and the relationship they had. And la later in life, his dad gets saved and his life has changed. It's transformed by the Holy Spirit. And then, and then he passes away. And then, <clears throat> you know, this is his contemplation that one day I'll see, I'll, see, I'll see my dad in heaven. And just the concept of heaven uh, got a hold of his, his heart. And that's where the song came from. But when you go to, uh, what's, what's the name of the group again? Mercy Me. Mercy Me, yeah. His, yeah, the reason they named the group Mercy Me is because his, his grandmother said, you're going to be a, you're going to go, you'll be a singer and sing Christian songs. And she said, mercy me. So <laughs> anyway, so yeah. So uh, anyway, we got to hear him at the Diamondbacks game and it was the best. Like he preaches, like it's, it's like a, it's just like an evangelistic service or a testimony service. And he is so good. I've seen it. We've heard other groups, but Bart and his group, the mercy me group just stands out. They're just amazing. They really really have a powerful message. So anyway, that was really fun singing with those guys. They picked it up right away. So um, appreciate uh, 
that song. So we're going to move into the end times. Now we have been kind of leading up to it so far. Like we've led up to it and led up to it. We were in the throne two years ago or two weeks ago. And then last week we looked at the seals and we looked at those in the throne room and some of the stuff that went on, kind of the introduction to the end times. But it's the introduction to the tribulation. I was just talking with Brother Doug. And, you know, there's three different views. Actually, there's like five or six, maybe ten different main views of eschatology and how the chronology is going to work if you use the book of Revelation. So there's an amillennialist who just kind of says this is all symbolic. It doesn't mean anything. You have post-millennial, which... Uh, uh, which says the millennium comes, I don't know, at, at another time. Premillennial, uh, it comes before Jesus actually ends, ends the kingdom and the king comes down at the end of millennium. And then there's, uh, and then within that, there's post-tribulation, pre-tribulation. Some people believe in a mid-tribulation. And then some people believe in a pre-wrath tribulation. So it can get really complicated. Now, I believe the Bible teaches premillennial. So in other words, there's a millennial time and then Jesus comes back and then we're with God, with God forever. And the millennium is a thousand years. So like, wow, that's a lot of years. But anyway, that's the premillennial idea. I believe that. I also believe in a pre-tribulation, a seven-year period of awful stuff that we're going to hear about today. I believe Jesus is going to come back before that period happens. And we will be taken away. And you've heard of the rapture. Amen. That word is not in the Bible, but it is, it's a word that describes what's going to happen. We're going to be raptured up, taken away. And so we're going to look at some things from chapter 6. We we're up through chapter 5, and we're going to look at chapter 6 today. So let's take a quick look. And I hope you have your Bibles with you. You can follow along. If not, I've got the scripture right here. Revelation chapter 6, the six sealed judgments is this part. And we're going to first of all begin by introducing the first verse of chapter 6. Now, I like to have my Bible, and I've been using the King James today. I want to follow along here in my Bible, so I'm going to have it here sitting in front of me. Sometimes I'll refer to the computer, but I want you to know this is coming out of the old-fashioned book. Uh, Doug and I were talking about our libraries when we, when we prepare for messages, and uh, I was saying, I'm glad I'm glad the digital age came. Well, I don't know if I am glad. I kind of like the old books. But I have a whole wall of books that I use to study the Bible. About half of them on that whole wall are books that I use to study the Bible. But I probably have another, maybe even larger uh, set of books in digital. So it's in my computer. It's this big. Maybe this big, you know. And all of those books are in that. And I can access them. I can access them faster. It's a lot easier way to study the Bible. But... I might have another wall of books in that little, little jump drive or whatever it is. So uh, anyway, so uh, let's, let's look at the first verse of chapter 6. Now, I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals. Remember, we were looking at the seven seals in the throne room, and Jesus was the only one who could open up the seals. Remember that? Now, when I watched and when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like, Thunder, come! That's where we are. We're going to look at what these seals are about here in this chapter. So I wanted to just make mention of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you want to turn back there, you can. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're looking at the end times, which could happen tomorrow. It could start tomorrow. Right? It could start tomorrow. And in 1 Thessalonians, you had... People that were being saved. It was an amazing revival in Thessalonica. Paul went there and preached. He's like, wow, people got saved. They heard the message of Jesus. They wanted to be saved. Gentiles and Jews were being saved amazingly. It was fantastic. And first lesson in the book of 1 Thessalonians, much of the book, the people are writing say, wait a minute. What about my parents who, got, who were also believers? What happened to them? They didn't have all the details that we have. They didn't have the whole counsel of God. So they were really worried. What happened to my parents? They're dead. And what you're telling me that Jesus is going to come back. The teaching that Jesus was going to come back was out there. And they go, well, if he comes back and takes me away, what happens to me? So look what Paul says about that. But not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, people that had gone on, had passed away, 
that ye sorrow not, even as others which may have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. He's talking about that rapture time, the beginning of the end, beginning of the end of the world, the end times. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He goes on to say, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, let's bring it back to that slide. I don't have to comment much on this. You can see it, can't you? Jesus comes back. And you go up. Now, I don't know exactly how that's going to be. If you're just going to be gone. If people will watch you go up, that's possible. We watched that old movie, The Thief in the Night, when I was a little kid. Seventh grade at the Assembly of God Church. Every church in town was there. And the opening scene there's a, starts out and they're singing, Man and wife asleep in bed. She hears a noise and turns his head. He's gone. I wish we'd all been ready. Remember that old song? And I remember watching that going, wow, wow. Now that, you can still watch that movie and it's so old fashioned, but it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's the rapture. And so this guy wakes, the, yeah, she turns his head, she's gone. His wife is a Christian and she's gone. And, and some of you have read maybe the Left Behind books, a similar thing. Remember they're up in the plane and, and the co-pilot, yeah, the co-pilot disappears. And then every, all these people in the plane are just clothes. So if the rapture, it could, rapture could happen like that. I'm not saying it, it's going to be exactly like that. And maybe you see people see you go up. I don't know. But I know this. The Bible says, I will see my dad really quickly after that happens. I can't wait for that. I'm going to see my dad, my dad who loved the Lord and his corny jokes and he was the greatest dad joker ever. <laughs> but I can't wait to see my dad who was here at this church and always taking care of things and coming to my house and taking care of things and loving me like a dad should, as a grandfather should. I'm going to see him. Amen. That's great hope for me. So Paul said, calm down. They just didn't understand the whole counsel of God. They knew they were sinners, they knew that they'd be saved, but they didn't have eschatology worked out. And it really, a lot of us still wonder about eschatology. We're still not sure. We're still not totally sure about all these things. And I was just telling Doug, you know, there's plenty of evidence that the rapture is going to happen and we are going to be taken out of here before the tribulation. Now, there's some more verses that say, well, maybe not. Maybe that's not what happens. But I was just saying, well, I'm going to live thinking that it could happen and I'm going to miss this awful time. Why not? You know, like, why not? Now, if I have to go through it, Lord, help me. Because God will be there for me. I know he loves me and he's going to take care of me during the seven-year period, which is really awful. So that's where we are. Now let's move on and, and get back to Revelation. These are the events of the tribulation. So we're in chapter 6, and the seals are going to be opened. Of that, that book that was presented in chapter 5, they're going to be opened. And so... We're going to look at six of the seals today. The seven happens in chapter eight. So then you've got to jump to chapter eight. So there's seven seals. But, and, and the six seals, except for the one about the martyrs, so there's really five judgments that happen in the seals. And that's chapter six, the six seals. Chapter eight is the trumpet judgments. That's the seventh seal. Okay? And you, know, you can go back and check this out in your scripture or maybe go online and find a good chart that will maybe show this. And maybe I'll put this on, I'll have something for you. I've got some really good charts on the chronology of all this stuff. Eight, nine are the trumpet judgments. Chapter 16 are the bowl judgments. And uh, there's some judgments there as well. It's not very pretty. It's the tribulation, ladies and gentlemen. It's judgment. It's judgment on the earth. You don't want to be here. But well, I need to preach it. It's part of the Bible. And uh, it's an interesting part of the Bible, so I like to, I like to kind of take a look at it because it's really interesting to me. So let's take a look. Since there are chapters in between, how should we look at chapter 7? 
Well, they're like parenthetical, a little extra commentary. Just the way that John put the book together. And sometimes books happen like that. So 6, 8, 9, 17 are these judgments. The in-between chapters, like chapter 7, is parenthetical. So let's move on. What is the first seal? Let's take a look at verse 6. Back in Revelation, I'm still over here. Back in Revelation chapter 6, look what it says in verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard it was a noise of thunder, and of the four beasts. It starts out with these four beasts, these four horses, actually. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Notice, he's conquering. But there's no mention of death, and that's really significant here. In fact, let me bring up the next slide. White horse guy. He looks pretty cool. Some people think he's Jesus. I don't believe he's Jesus. So, so some people thought, well, maybe it's Jesus on a white horse in chapter, because in chapter 19, Jesus is on a white horse. But it's a different situation. And the, the crown is actually, there's a crown on both of these riders. It's the Antichrist, the one who wants to look like Jesus, that's riding this horse here. And that's one thing about the Antichrist. He's wanting to look righteous, even though he's very evil. That's true of the Antichrist in all of the descriptions we have in the scripture of him. The word for crown is different, and the things done here are not things Jesus would do. 6.1 is the Greek word Stephanos, and the word in chapter 19.11 is diadema. So it's a different person here, and I think those things prove that to be true. Is the Antichrist... It is the Antichrist. He tried to look like Christ. He goes around trying to conquer. He does the conquering. It doesn't, there's no mention of resistance. And when you get into the other judgments, there's all these awful things that are happening. You would think that would have been shared here, but it wasn't. This is the Antichrist. No mention of great loss of life. The Antichrist will deceive many and many will follow him. That's the first part of the tribulation. We'll get into that a little bit more later on about this Antichrist in the first three and a half years. He is going to be most likely some world leader that's going to bring this kind of one world government together. And this, this is a commentary that I'm giving you of my perspective about who this person will be. Most likely a political world leader that maybe will have some sort of amazing, maybe a discovery that's saving the world or come up with some sort of science kind of thing that will just knock everyone's socks off and impress people. He will show a side of him that will look amazing. And then he will also conquer those who don't go along with him. That's who this first three and a half year leader, the Antichrist, will be like. That's the kind of person that he will be. So that's the first horse, the Antichrist. Many will follow him. He will deceive many. He will conquer and bring most of the world to his side. Second seal, a rider on a red horse, second half of the tribulation begins really with this next judgment, I think most likely. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So this is the war, the war time. A third world war will not be pretty. Uh, we have this, uh, the, uh, have you guys played the, um, have you guys played the World War I, World War II imperialism game in your world history classes? Okay, so Connor's done it. Uh, at, at the school we have this simulation game that like recreates World War I. All the kids become countries and then they kind of recreate the scenario. Of course they get to make decisions so it's not exactly like World War I or World War II happened but they're able to create, and so it's an amazing thing. Well, they have one on the Cold War, and I saw it demonstrated yesterday. And so in the Cold War, you guys know, the nuclear bombs are everywhere, throughout Russia and the United States, and then in the NATO countries. And if one day Russia decided to push all the buttons and send theirs, and then we wanted to send ours to defend ourselves, the loss of life would be unbelievable. All the great cities of the world would be devastated. That's the kind of power that's still available today. Thank God cooler heads have been at those places. Man. And I just, I, I saw it. There, there was a scenario where 
uh, that the war would happen and, and the, the Russian leader would push the button and, it would, and the bombs would go off. And then you had, you had 60 seconds for the allied, you know, the, the United States to decide if they wanted to send the bombs back. So if they didn't do anything, then just their whole world would die. So they had to do it. So everyone's dead. That's most likely the second seal. A war that's going to be devastating and many, many people will die from it. Kill one another. There was given unto him. Maybe not. Maybe it's not going to be nuclear. Maybe that's going to happen in one of the other judgments. That's possible. Uh, because there's more, more destruction and judgment that comes along. Let's move on. A break, peace is taken is what I'm saying. Great war begins. Much blood will be shed. And then we move on to the third seal. The black rider. The black, the black the rider on the black horse. And when he had opened up the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat in him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So basically, in doing some little research on this, basically what was, what's happening is, uh, the famine is really great in this particular situation. And in, in, in my reading about this, people were saying this famine, not only a penny by eight measures of barley, now only one. The food supply will be one-eighth of what it normally would be. And, you know, we know some environmental things can really wreak havoc on the food supply. So this is, this is a believable thing. I think most of us can, yeah, we can see maybe something like that happening. Thankfully, we have things in place that will help us to avoid that. But that's the kind of thing, the suffering that happens in this third judgment. Yet luxury foods will be available. This is interesting. Luxury foods will be available, but almost there will be very few people that can buy them. What it says, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So that's kind of like the luxury items. You won't be able to buy those because they'll be way more expensive than most people can purchase. Don't lay a finger on this because you won't have the money to do it. The fourth seal, verse 7 and 8. And when he had opened the fourth seal, this isn't really a judgment. It's more of a commentary. I heard the voice of the fourth be say, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse. And his name sat on him was death. No, that's the, I'm sorry, that's the fifth seal. This is, a, this is more of the destruction. Death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death, the rider on the pale host, yellow in color. Death represents physical death. Hell represents the spiritual death. One quarter of the people die. I don't know what, I don't know what millions that is, or billions that is, but that's many people. It's going to be very, very sad. Three ways people die. With the sword, war, with hunger, more famine. The beasts of the earth, creatures will kill humans. I don't know what that's going to be like. I don't know if there's going to be some supernatural kind of effect on animals or some sort of natural effect on animals that will cause them to kill humans. It's going to be horrible. The fifth seal, the one slain for God's word. This is an interesting one. It comes open. It says, and when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And for the testimony in which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? It's an interesting idea and concept that's listed here. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So out in the middle of these judgments comes this commentary about martyrs, people that have died for the cause of Jesus Christ. During the tribulation, people are going to come to Christ. I know that sounds weird. I know in, in Left Behind, it was really interesting, some of the ways they presented it. Some of the people that knew about Jesus before were able to get saved. I'm not totally sure that's going to happen. That's why we have to tell people, be saved today. You don't want to end up in the tribulation. Now, it, it, I can't say for sure that someone that you witness to, they understand what you're saying and they just reject Jesus. I can't for sure that person can't get saved in the tribulation. But I just wonder about it. There are some verses in the Bible that question whether that's, that can happen. 
In other words, get saved now. Don't leave it up to chance in the tribulation. Some people will get saved during the tribulation. There will be martyrs, martyrs in the tribulation. There will be martyrs before the tribulation, people that die. And they ask, how long will you not avenge us? It's kind of interesting how they ask, Lord, man, the, the suffering that we went through was horrible. And they want vengeance for it. It's kind of interesting. I, I, I don't like the attitude in some ways. I look at this, I go, wow, shouldn't they just be humble and want those people to change? But I guess it's at a point in time in history where that's not going to happen. And that God's going to bring vengeance. But God says, what? Wait, be patient. So maybe God's saying, wow, there's still a chance for some people. I don't know. And maybe, maybe these saints are just arrogant. I don't know. I'm not sure about that. <coughs> the answer is wait. White robes, a symbol of purity and truth. He says, I'm going to give you white robes because of what you did, because you stood for, for God and you are a martyr. They address the Lord as the great authority in all of the world. It shows their respect for the Lord. And then we move on. The sixth seal. This is really bad. The sixth seal is just bad. I, I, and in the notes in the bulletin, I just say very bad. Because it's very bad. Look at what's mentioned here. And behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. And the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her in timely figs, which she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Unbelievable stuff. Now, some of this stuff can be looked at as figurative, but we know about the earthquake, the black sun. I don't know what happened. If it's going to be some sort of natural occurrence that's going to cause the sun to be dark. It's going to be dark all the time with a black sun, you would think. And then... A red moon, and I don't know exactly, we know about different colored moon and some of the different effects, but this is, a, this is maybe a symbolic thing. It's the blood moon. Meteor shower on the earth, and that, neck, that one verse about, uh, let's see, let's go back to it real fast. It says, and the stars of the heaven fell into the earth even as a fig tree cast with her. So it seems like that would be a meteor shower. So watch out. It sounds like it's going to be dangerous. Every mountain and island will be moved. By the way, there's no like or as. So this is not a figurative concept. This is what's going to happen. So there's going to be some sort of cataclysmic, maybe a natural thing that God allows to happen on this earth that will cause the mountains and the islands and the land to move, which will be wild. I don't want to ride that roller coaster. But... So that's the sixth seal judgment. So what purpose for these judgments? Look at verse 15 through 17. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. Now, the reason he mentions all these different types of people is because he's saying, look, it's not just going to be the poor people. You know, when there is some sort of natural disaster, who suffers the most? The homeless. The people in very difficult situations, they're the ones. This is saying, look, everyone is going to suffer. No one's going to miss out on the judgment that's happening in, this, in these seals. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This is bad. This is the tribulation. This is the judgment. And I don't know. I don't know. You know, I look at this. I know my God is, you know, you think, how can you say there's a loving God? My God is a loving God. He cares about me. He loves me. He died for me. Amen. And he saw me as a sinner and he provided a way of salvation. That overcomes all of this stuff that we read about. I present it to you, and you know, I could just skip Revelation and not put that as a part of what I teach. But I think it's important for us to know the whole counsel of God, and I think it's important to know that it's a really awful time. The judgment's not going to be a good thing. And this is the judgment on the earth. But the judgment for those who don't know Jesus, that's not going to be good either. There's a literal place called hell. 
I don't want my loved ones to go there. I want to share the gospel with my loved ones. And, and there's no other way. People can create all they want to. You know, the Bible is either true or it isn't. And so these things that we read about in Revelation, and some people just say it's all figurative, and, and they want to just kind of put, you know, just put it away. And I don't believe that's the way to do it. But it's here for us. The tribulation, it, it's out there. It's going to happen. Luckily, as we read, there's the rapture. And he's going to come and get us. And I believe that to be true in Revelation. The great day of wrath is coming. Who shall be able to stand? Now, one more thing I want to do. This is, a, oh, this, is, this is kind of a summary. This is a worldwide judgment. It touches everyone, great and rich, free men and servants. People are hiding because it's so bad. People act like judgment is on them. The great day of his wrath is come. They would rather seek death than prolong life. That's kind of an interesting idea. Some people will feel like that. It's so bad. And then I want to end with these, back to 1 Thessalonians with these verses from the believers, for the believers from Paul. He says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. He says, Don't worry about it. We don't know when it's going to come. It's going to come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Yeah, if you want to know the feeling about when it's going to come, it's like a pregnant woman who doesn't really know, or maybe the baby comes a week early and it just comes upon her, and oh my, it happened. Like a thief in the night. But ye children are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. You're not in darkness. Thessalonians, you're believers. You know Jesus. You're going to be able to get through this. God will... God will give you everything you need if you end up having to go through this tribulation, which he obviously said you're not. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Brothers and sisters, we are children of light, not of darkness. Therefore, let us sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a an helmet, the hope of salvation. So a lot of concepts here. I'm not going to get into maybe every one of them. Sober is one that's mentioned here. So we need to be aware and not a constant drunk, drunkenness kind of attitude, like a partying attitude. I don't really care. I'm just going to live my life and I don't care about what's going to happen. We should care about it, but we shouldn't be fearful because you know, God, God has said that we're children of light. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. He has not appointed us to wrath. That's a big thing. And this is the, I think this is the verse that people say, well, we're going to be in the tribulation, but it's not going to happen until the wrath happens. Who died for us that... Whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye also do. The concept of heaven and the end for a believer should always be an encouragement that can overcome any trial, any tribulation, any difficulty that you have. It should be the thing. It helps when you have like my dad, you know, I know he's in heaven. My grandfather, my grandmother, Sarah's, you know, parents and grandparents, you know, they, they knew Jesus, man. I know that. I, I knew, I, I talked with them. They know, they knew Jesus. And that's a helpful thing too. Uh, and and it, it should be something that should like challenge us to want to share Christ and, and you know, the hope of heaven. Like it's, it, it's real. It's true. It, it, there's something there. And it should have an effect on our lives. And that's the, that's the encouragement that I want to give you. I've been given, this has kind of been the theme of these passages in Revelation. As we look at the tribulation, that's something we should consider, though. That is the hope, is the hope of heaven. The hope of avoiding the tribulation and then being with God forever. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful for the encouragement. The hope of heaven for the believer is a powerful concept that we should never forget. 
We should live it every day. Thank you for how you work in our lives and how you love us so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Make it through the night.